looking at, if you're new here, we've been going through 1 Corinthians, and we have paused a couple times, one for our Advent series for Christmas, and now for our Easter series, and we're both times, we've been going through the Psalms. And I love it, I think I've said this almost every week, we've been going through it, these are the songs that Jesus sang. This is God giving us his songbook, and they're, 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 they're absolutely beautiful. Now this psalm today is Psalm 118, and it's written by, uh, well, we'll talk about who it's written by here in a minute, but the idea of it is there, there's this people who are in need of deliverance, and they need God to rescue them, right? They need a Savior, a Redeemer, given the pressure that they're in. And there's something I can understand about this, right? I mean, I, I, on, at least on the opposite end, I, I have children. I, want, I like the idea of being my kid's superhero. I want to save them and protect them. I want to be my daughter like, forever and ever. I want to be, you know, the protector of my daughter. And, and even my son, even though one day I hope he can protect himself. But, like, I still want to be there for him. But I, like, I want to be, dad wants to be their superhero, and it was funny, the other day, Maddox, uh, he, he loves superheroes, he said to me. Um, he, I asked him what my superhero name was, uh, and he told me, he said, uh, your name will be uh, Captain Shortlegs. <laughs> I'm, ha- I'm happy you all find that funny. I, I took, <laughs> no, I, it was, and, and he took it back, because I was like, are you, are you making a short joke on your dad? Like, what, what's going on, Captain Shortlegs? And I'm like, what does he do? He's like, well, he gets really short. <laughs> Fitting for you, right, Dad? So, so this was this. Uh, but again, we, we I, there's this desire to be a hero. And what's wonderful, as the children of God, we do have a Father who is that, who is our protector and our redeemer, and, and it's it is forever. And so this this is a beautiful Psalm 118. Um, it's quoted uh, just uh, when we talked about uh, 110 last week. Quoted 17 times in the New Testament. Psalm 118 is quoted 11 times. And oftentimes, uh, this was used in the church as a call to worship. You heard Baker uh, read those first four verses, which that's what it was. It's a call to worship. And if you follow the psalm, you'll see that you have a disgraced people who are redeemed and protected by the work of the Lord. I want to read that call to worship again to get our minds ready Verse 1 of Psalm 118, oh give, us, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His steadfast love endures forever. And let those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. This is the psalm. Is part of what we would call the Halil. Right? The Halil is actually a group of psalms. It's, one, it's Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. And you actually know the term Halil. It means praise. You know it from the term hallelujah, which means praise Yahweh. Now, this is a psalm that offers praise for God's providence, both to his individuals and to his people. Right? It pleads to God not to forsake his people. And it praises God for the past acts of salvation. But the psalm ultimately looks to the future for deliverance and for redemption. Now we'll see historically Israel saying this, praying that they would be redeemed and rescued and delivered from foreign nations. But it was destined to find a greater purpose. This psalm has a special place in the lives of the Old Testament church and the New Testament church. The Old Testament church would sing this uh, in, in, during Passover around, the, around their table. Their families would gather and they would sing the psalm. The Levit- Levitical priesthood would sing it before the altar. And we see in the New Testament church the psalm is often read and sang in many churches across the world as we enter into Passover or enter into Palm Sunday. So I ask that you be praying that, that, that Scripture pierces your heart, that we can lay distractions aside, and that we can focus on His Word. 
Let's pray before we begin. God, you are good. You are gracious. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace, Lord, that you would speak to us through Scripture. Father God, you are more than we deserve. Lord, let us reflect on you this morning. Lord, we came here to worship you, and Lord, I pray that is our focus, that we worship you as King, as our Redeemer, as our Protector, as our living hope. Lord, we thank you again, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're a note taker, we have four points. We have the pressure, the protection, the plea, and the promise. The first point is uh, the pressure. Now, the context of this psalm is, is a little interesting uh, because we, we don't really know who, who wrote it. There's two theories. One, that it's Moses, and this is because the, the, the psalm writer quotes Moses often in, in Exodus 15 quite often in this psalm. The other thought that it's, that it's David. But either way, this psalm is, is born out of, out of stress and out of pressure. Now, I, I think many of you maybe to relate and experience this, this pressure in our lives, whether it's internal or external, whether it's sins from the past that seem to haunt us and follow us, sometimes overwhelming us. I want you to hear verse 5 of Psalm 18. It says, Out of my distress I call on the Lord. The Lord answered me. And set me free. And out of my distress. This is a common theme to all men. It is often in our distress that we turn to the Lord. And when we discover that our great dependency is on the Lord, right? What we are met with is a benevolent God. Listen again. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. And what does the Lord do? He answers me and sets me free. The Lord's response to the writer's dependency is grace. Verse 6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can men do to me? How reassuring. Especially for us who fear the actions of men. Any pain to think that this is temporal. This, this will quickly cease given the context of eternity. And I know about me, I know what I continually learn is that pain, no matter how deep, it can be used to further the gospel. But what do we see? Is this Lord who's on my side, I'm not going to fear because I have, I have a God who's sovereign over all things including my pain, and including those things that's, that terrify me. You see, the writer of Hebrews echoes a sentiment, right? He says, so we can say confidently, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can men do to me? I think Jesus puts this in context. In Matthew 10, 28, And do not fear for those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Like there's this great joy that follows in the understanding that the Lord alone is the one who sets you free. That he alone gives assurance. But here's the thing. We see something interesting in Romans chapter 3. Right? It says that no one is good, no one seeks after God. That it's, it's quoting the psalm. It talks about how no one is righteous. But that no one, not one, seeks after the Lord. Yet we see here that God is on our side. I find that fascinating. How is it that God is on my side if at the same time Scripture says that I do not seek after Him? You're on God's side because of His sovereign grace. So why fear if we know that our Lord is the good shepherd 
who's drawn us to himself for his glory and for his purpose. And we've seen this in the past weeks as we've been going through these psalms, right? We see the Lord laughs at his enemies. He mocks his enemies. And he sits and waits, not in fear. So therefore, we do not have fear because we know the promises of God. We know his faithfulness. I love going back to Psalm 18, verse 4. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. I hope you can see the contrast. Rather than fearing men who can do nothing permanently to you, fear the Lord, your God, who is almighty, who can permanently keep you and heal you. We do not fear because we know where victory is given. But we know where victory lays. So I want us to imagine this. As Jesus is, is marching into Jerusalem, and they're singing this psalm, because this is the psalm that they're referencing, and that they're singing as Christ is entering into the city. No doubt the Jews have felt the pressures of outside kingdoms. If you know, if you know Jewish history, especially right before the Romans, you had the Greeks, the Greeks who used to mock and there's, there's this, these testimonies of Jews being stripped down and made to, to participate in athletic games naked, going against the, the law that they hold so dear. The temple was used for, 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 to have orgies in and to get drunken by the, by the Greeks. And then after the Greeks go, you have the Romans. They're still under the thumb of a foreign king. And as Jesus is entering into the city, they believed their hope was appearing. And as they sang, Hosanna, they're crying out, save us. Lord, please save us. But what we see is that it only took a few days before their song stopped. Because of his crucifixion, he no longer appeared victorious. But we know, right, victory was still his. The crucifixion may be the greatest reminder that men can do nothing to thwart God's plan. Right? And, and our greatest efforts to thwart the will of Christ, we ultimately do his will. Psalm 118, verse 7. The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than trust in princes. Again, why has God chosen you to be on his side? He knows you completely. And yet he has drawn you to... I mean, this is something I can't, I can't escape only because I know my own baggage. The fact that we see this God who is my helper. We see that it is completely because of his grace. And we see that he gives victory and he gives help to the defeated and to the desperate. To those who acknowledge they have nowhere else to go but to Christ. That he alone is where we take refuge. This can be especially difficult when we so see, you know, see so much hurt and pain, not only in our own lives, but in the lives around us. And we're thinking, God, what is your plan? What are you doing? Where are you? I mean, imagine the disciples watching Christ crucified. Where a week ago, he was marching through the city and they had thought the king of kings had arrived to rule, to create an earthly kingdom. Think what they, what was going through their mind. They're probably thinking, what, what, are, you, what are you doing 
How is this happening? What on earth is your plan? It is hard to trust in a plan that we don't make. And there's no doubt, given our limited knowledge, we do not and we cannot understand always what God is doing. But we remember that this is a plan that was created by a good and sovereign God. And what we know is there's a pressure to trust in princes. There's a pressure to trust in those things that you can see. And the more that we fall into that pressure of trusting temporal things for deliverance, the more we will find ourselves in defeat brought about our own defiance. Verses 10 through 13 reads, All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord I will cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling. But the Lord helped me. Do you hear the desperation of the writer? Whether it's Moses or whether it's David. This pain that he can't escape. This desperation that he can't outrun. In verse 13, when it says, I was pushed hard, it actually in Hebrew means you pushed hard. And who is he speaking to? He's speaking to his God. Now imagine that. He's saying, you pushed me down, you pushed me hard, so that I was falling. The pressure was allowed, it was allowed to bring about dependency. That was the goal of pushing down the writer. I'm going to allow pressure. By the will of the Lord, I'm going to bring you back to me. I think of, I, I know, uh, I, told, I told my wife that I do this, and she was like, what's wrong with you? But when we go out shopping sometimes, or it used to be, Maddox has gotten better about it now, but Maddox would, he would run a little further than he should. I'd say, Maddox, stay close. Maddox, stay close. Maddox, come back. Come back. You're getting too far. And he wouldn't listen. So what do we as sadistic parents do? We take a couple steps back, and we go around a corner, and we just wait. And that's often what I would do. I'd take a couple steps back. I'd, I'd kind of hide behind the corner, waiting for him to feel alone. He wasn't. I, I had him. But that's the concept here. The writer here, he feels alone. The Lord was pushing him down so he could feel alone. So he could see his complete and utter dependency. On God. And then once he saw it, he writes, the Lord helped me. I love what Augustine says here. He says, those who fall away from piety do so not by the work of God, but by their own will. They're not forced to fall. Right? In our depravity, that's exactly what we do. We run away. And it's only by his will that we return to his hand. We would keep running. Would it not be for the hand of God who holds us secure? So when we drift in, in his holy chastisement, right, the Lord applies pressure with the goal of us running back to his arms, realizing how weak and insufficient we are. And so that's what the writer shows here in these few verses in the beginning of the psalm. Next we see God's protection. Psalm 118, 14 through 18, it reads, The Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. Glad song and salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die but I shall live, and I will recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. 
these verses 14 through 16 are, are, are actually quoted, from, again, from the book of Exodus chapter 15. And so this is why we, we don't know exactly who wrote it, but, but David could be telling this more of this narrative of God's people of the past and of the present. But I want to take a moment and look at verse 14. Right naturally, the writer felt the pressure from all around, and now he sees the Lord's protection. Right? He sees his strength, and he's completely relying on the Lord. And what I love, he says, now we see, right? The Lord, he says, you are my song. The Lord is my strength, and he's my song. Right? His, his heart is so full that it overflows to his mouth. He cannot help but sing. The praises of his God. That is the regenerated heart. The heart that's been changed by Christ. It's a heart that's so overwhelmed and so full of the grace of God that you cannot help but to sing his praises and to tell people of this Lord. Psalm 14, or 118, verse 14 says, He has become my salvation. <laughs> we could sit on that all day long. He has become my salvation. Right? The, the Lord is not just his Savior. The Lord literally has drug him to glory by the strength of God. The Lord has become and it is the only means by which his people are delivered. It wasn't a one-time act. There's this constant permanency in which the writers depended on the Lord. Right? Jesus paints this so well in, in the book of John, in chapter 10, 28, and 29. He says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. Now listen, and no one, no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who's given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. It's not as if Jesus saved you, and now he stands you up, and you stand by your own strength. Right? You are his, and you are in his hand forever. Any strength you have to stand is because he's holding you. I want to read verses 14 through 18 again in Psalm 118. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tent of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly, and the right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. And I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Now, in our home, there is a, uh, every Monday night, typically, there's a, there's a small debate that occurs. My wife says, Jeremy, can you take the trash out? And I say, yeah, I will. She goes, no, I need you to do it right now. I will, I will, I will. I'll do it. I'll do it. She's like, no, no, I need, I need you to stop whatever you're doing, and I need you to go get the trash, and I need you to take it out. I'm going to do it in the morning. <laughs> no, you won't. Yes, I will. No, you won't do this in the morning. And the reason why she knows this is she's recounting my lack of deeds in the past. Because always, on Tuesday, as the truck is driving by in the morning, at 5 in the morning, I'm quickly trying to get up and get the trash out there so I can say, I remembered. <laughs> what the Lord is it, recounting the deeds of the Lord is like the opposite. But we... <laughs> Remembering God's goodness in the past puts hope in the future. But we look to the past, and we can see that the Lord brings his people life. I mean, to, to recount the deeds of the Lord, listen to me carefully. For us to recount the deeds of the Lord means we need to be people who are in his word. I hope that makes sense to you. 
If you're going to recount the deeds of the Lord, you're going to have to be in his word and know his deeds. Know what he's done. This is, this is why the Lord calls you to keep the word ever before you. So you can in confidence recount the deeds of the Lord when, when the pressure bears down. I want to read Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. The idea is keeping the word ever before you, lest you forget what the Lord has done. to teach them in your home so we can be constantly reminding ourselves the God we serve. Psalm 118, verse 18, the Lord has disciplined me severely, but he's not given me over to death. Now, no one likes discipline. Right? No one likes discipline. No one also likes accountability. It's that one thing where, like, I need someone to hold me accountable. And until, you know, for accountability to matter, it has to have teeth, right? But no one wants to be disciplined. Everyone hates it. I, I, I oftentimes, right, if I discipline one of my children, my, my daughter specifically, I say, you know, she gets in trouble. Not often, but she does. And, and uh, when I have to get on her, right, she, she doesn't really understand it. She, th- she thinks it's so personal. She'll, she'll look at me and go, don't you love me? Don't you, don't you love me? Don't, aren't you my, like, what happened? Why are you sitting in my room the time out? I thought you wanted to be with me, right? Like, it's overly dramatic. She doesn't quite understand, or she does, and she's like an evil genius. But we see the writer understands the purpose of discipline. We saw the pressure that the writer was under. The Lord was protecting his people by offering chastisement. He was disciplining his people for their good. The Lord is also protecting his own name by allowing discipline. As image bearers and Christ followers... We have to ask, are we shaming the gospel? Do we live a life worthy of the gospel? There's an idea where the Lord is going to protect his own name. Because it is his glory that is his most, his, that's his prized concern. So he's making his people He's making them understand who they are before the Lord in his discipline. You see God making a holy people who recognize that their hearts and their lips should speak of their only hope, which is in him. But grace is seen when our protector does not give us what we deserve death. I I hope that you understand, if you're here now, that what you deserved, no matter how small the sin, it was big enough for Christ to die for, and thus you were guilty and deserve death. But in His grace, He offers us discipline to draw us back to Himself in a way that's often, and most often, uncomfortable. But he does it for our eternal comfort. 
So we see this protector. And hear the plea of the psalmist, verses 19 and 20. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. The gates in the temple would lead uh, to the sanctuary. It was leading to where the, pre- uh, the presence of God was. And it may be a good way to think about it. If you've ever been to the White House, you see the big gates out front, and they got all the security, all the protective measures. It's not because the door of the house itself, it's the person who dwells in the house. That's what they're trying to protect. That's why the gates are important. The gates are righteous because of the one who dwells behind it. So look at the psalmist's position. He's on the outside looking in. And it's not by the psalmist, uh, by, by his will, that the gates open. It's not by his works. It's not by his righteousness that he gets to enter before the Lord and give thanks. He's pleading to the Lord. Open the gates of righteousness. It is by the will of God who opens the gates. The psalmist who has not been given over to death now stands before the gate of the Lord. The psalmist isn't worthy of anything. Again, he's not righteous. But yet he has seen the kindness of the Lord. Now, the psalmist is is before this narrow gate. This is likely uh, the gate that Jesus is is alluding to in on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 13, and 14, when he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now, before our faith was coined as Christianity, in the early church, the the Christians were known as being part of the way. That's what the faith was called, the way. The idea was this was the way that led to these gates of righteousness sung about in Psalm 118. It was by following Christ that one would find these gates of righteousness. Of course, none of us would seek to find these gates on our own had it not been for his effectual calling in our lives. Which is why we can see him before the gates of the Lord speaking and praising God for answering him while maintaining Scripture when it says no one seeks after God because of God's sovereign, effectual calling on his people. So how do an unrighteous people enter through a narrow and righteous gate? Listen, it is by the imputed righteousness of God. It's only after what we call the great exchange. The great exchange. It's where you imputed your sin onto Christ, and he imputed his righteousness onto you. It is why We can approach the Father in prayer, but only by the name of Christ. It is why, and the only reason, we can be called good and faithful servants. It's why we're made co-heirs for a kingdom we don't deserve. 1 Peter 2, verse 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Listen, he has become, and this is what the psalmist is saying, he has become your salvation. And by his death we are healed. It's by his death we find righteousness. Verses 21 through 24 reads, I thank you that you've answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is the marvelous in in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made and let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know the song 
this, this, I'm not going to try to sing it to you. <laughs> it would be bad. But you know the song, this is the day the Lord has made. Let, I, oh, I was this close to singing it. Now, th- there's, a, there's a, this is a bit of a misuse of this verse. To say, this is the day the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it, is, is not referencing every new morning that we wake up. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't rejoice in another day. But that's not what verse, this, this verse is referencing in verse 24. What the psalmist is referencing is that we can rejoice in the day that Christ drank the wrath of our sins the day where our sins were nailed to a cross, this is the day, right? Look through verse 21 through 24. This is the day where he became our salvation. This is the day where the cornerstone was rejected. This was the day where the Lord's doing was marvelous in our eyes. Now think back again to Christ entering into Jerusalem. People praising, singing, overly excited. Some of the disciples having that conversation, who is going to be at your right hand? He tries to explain to them, you don't understand what you're asking. But the feeling, the feeling of this day, this prophesied moment of the Messiah riding in, and they're all shouting, save us, save us. saw their hope and their public following of Christ. But what do we see? This great turning on Jesus just five days later. It was easy to get lip service when the city followed him to the temple. But he did not become their salvation because he, they, they did not know him. Anyone who approaches the gates of righteousness is in his own name is cursed because he fails to see his own unworthiness. This writer who was once in death, whose plea has been answered, is now driven to worship. You have become my salvation, is what he sings. But Jesus is not a crucial part of your salvation, he is your salvation. Is the cornerstone. Ephesians 2 19 through 21 says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, and him, the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Something we need to remember is that that verse 22 in Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. In our depravity and our blindness, we casted out what was necessary. I cannot stress enough that all of Christian doctrine and all of our existence to be built upon Christ and his gospel. Our identity should be built and and laid upon that, what Christ has done for you, and then nothing else. This is why we gather here. It isn't to to build, having some sort of emotional service or having, uh, you know, so we can brag about numbers or anything like that. We gather together, and the reason we have a service is we exalt the name of Christ and Him alone. Everything we do here should be built on this understanding that Christ is the cornerstone. Psalm 23 and 24, or verse 23 and 24, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made, and let us rejoice and be glad in it. God reminds us that the plan of salvation 
threw the rejected stone was his idea. And the realization that God reigns, and this was his idea, and, he, and yet he still draws it to himself. This should cause unceasing joy. I, there was a point in time where I was, I'm deeply, and I still am a deep skeptic, where I was deeply skeptical of emotionalism. Right, the idea of someone playing soft music constantly as I was trying to pray. Because I always felt like I was trying to, I was, they were attempting to manipulate me in some way or form. And I was very unsecure about any emotions that I had. I had a good friend who somewhat called me out on it, my distrust of emotions. He said, listen, there, there, he understood that there is a, especially in the context of American Christianity, there is a good concern, and you should discern when this idea of emotion taking over. But, he made a wonderful point to me, was with the work of the Lord, it, sh it, it should not be emotionless. It should draw us to rejoice and have passion. Verses 25 and 26. Save us, we pray, O oh Lord. O oh Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Now, when they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, this means save us, we pray. Save us, we pray. This is what they're shouting to Jesus as he's riding into Jerusalem. Save us, we pray. Hosanna. What a song. The regenerated heart pleads to God to save us. And it's only a regenerated heart that recognizes our complete inability to save ourselves. And it's only by a regenerated heart does they Sinner, seek a savior. Finding a God who in his kindness and mercy answers that plea with a promise. I want to show you the promise again in verses 25, 26. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. So we see, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The promise is to those who by grace have been given faith that God's people will be saved. And they will be blessed and they will share in the undeserved blessings of the Messiah. Verse 27, the Lord is God and he has made his light to shine upon us, bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the thorns of the altar. Right, we see in the psalm the sacrificial lamb being brought forth, being paraded through Jerusalem. And we saw it again as Christ makes his way to the temple. John, in the Gospel of John, it's put so well, and we see it, 1812, so the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him up. All the Old Testament sacrifices foreshadowed this greater sacrifice that was to come, that was to ride on a donkey. Finally, Psalm 28 and 29, you are my God. And I will give thanks to you. You are my God and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Do you hear that promise? Our promise to, to our God is only possible. Why? Because he first loved us. And he divinely imposed his covenant promise to his people. And he fulfilled that promise. And because his love endures forever, the love of his saints will persevere. That's the promise we can cling to. Our rescue from death, our life in Christ, 
It rests in him, and it's secured by him. In, in the Lord, right? It says our good works were prepared by him. In the Lord, our salvation was appointed by him. So let us sing, Hosanna, to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. You are our God, and we will give thanks to you. You are our God, and we will extol you. We give thanks to you, Lord, for you are good, for your steadfast love endures forever. Let us pray.